So today what we're going to be looking at is chapter 13, which is over aggregate demand and aggregate supply analysis. So in the last chapter, we kind of briefly introduced the idea of aggregate demand and what it was. Um, remember, it was um, developed by John Maynard Keynes, an English economist, who essentially um, developed um, the aggregate demand model. And so... Um, in this chapter, we'll be kind of going over aggregate demand itself again, and then also putting with it um, short run and long run aggregate supply, as well as looking at macroeconomic equilibrium. So this chapter will kind of be going back to concepts learned in chapter three when, when we were first learning about shifting um, the demand curve and the supply curve. But so overall, we've um, modeled long run economic growth and we've seen how GDP is determined in the short run. And so now we're extending the model in the short run to look at real GDP, employment and the price level. And so what we how we do that is through the AD aggregate demand and AS aggregate supply model, um, which is a model that explains short run fluctuations in real GDP and price level. Okay, so the first one we're going to look at is um, the aggregate demand curve itself. The aggregate demand curve shows the relationship between, again, the price level and the quantity of real GDP demanded by households, firms, and the government, both inside and outside of the country. And then later on, we'll look at the short-run aggregate supply curve or what I'll refer to as SRAS. Okay, so remember, when we were talking about GDP in the last section of chapters, we determined the four components of GDP. Those were Y, which is GDP equals C plus I plus G plus NX, which were, stood for C for consumption, I for investment, G for government spending, and NX for net exports. So um, the government... Purchases themselves are generally determined by policymakers, and we're going to kind of look at that in the next coming chapters when it comes to actual policies being implemented by both the Federal Reserve Bank and Congress. So we also want to think about um, a few different effects that occur. We have the wealth effect, the interest rate effect, and the international trade effect. So with the wealth effect, essentially, overall, your household consumption is going to be determined by income, but it's also determined by wealth. So essentially, when we're looking at price level in relation to how that affects GDP, higher prices are going to lead to lower consumption. As far as the interest rate effect goes, again, looking at how price level is impacting um, GDP, when it comes to interest rates, that's obviously what the businesses have to pay the bank in order to, um, you know, have enough funds to um, run their businesses. And so the price of holding money or the interest rate as that increases, um, it's going to lead to lower investment. And then finally, we have the international trade effect, which is looking at how um, price levels, specifically um, exchange rates, affect um, how much exports cost versus imports. And so when we look at that, um, if the U.S. price level rises, exports are going to become more expensive, imports become cheaper, therefore we're going to have fewer exports and that's going to um, lower GDP overall. So we have lower net exports.
So another thing that we talked about in chapter three was knowing the difference between a movement along the curve and an actual shift of the curve. So again, we're seeing that idea come up again, but we're looking at this time at aggregate demand overall. And so a movement along the aggregate demand curve occurs when a change in price level occurs and the change in price is not caused by a component of real GDP changing. Remember, so the aggregate demand curve itself is made up of components of real GDP versus a actual shift of the curve happens when a component changes. Okay. So now that we've kind of talked about shifting the curve, we're going to discuss the factors that actually cause a shift of the aggregate demand curve. And so um, the first thing we want to look at is, again, um, government policy. So when it comes to changes in government policy, we have two major categories. The first being monetary. And then the second being fiscal. So we're actually going to look at both of these um, individually as their own separate chapters, but we're going to just briefly introduce um, how they affect the AD curve um, in this chapter. So with monetary policy, that includes the actions of the Federal Reserve Bank itself the actions they take to manage the money supply and interest rates to um, pursue macroeconomic policy objectives. And so what happens is if interest rates or IR, I'm going to call them, increase, what will happen is remember interest rates are what businesses have to pay in order to um, borrow money to fund their operations. And so if interest rates rise, investment spending is going to actually fall, which will cause aggregate demand to shift left. So the L stands for left. However, if interest rates increase, or actually we just did that, if interest rates decrease, investment will increase because now it's cheaper for businesses to borrow money. And so investment spending increases so aggregate demand is going to shift right. Bar. Okay. On the other side, on the other type of policy, we Fiscal policy is actual changes to taxes and government purchases that's used to achieve macroeconomic objectives. So if we increase taxes or the government increases taxes, consumption will decrease. That's a very poorly drawn arrow, I apologize. Consumption will decrease, so aggregate demand is going to shift left. And vice versa, if taxes decrease, consumption is going to increase because you have more income to spend, so aggregate demand would shift right. Now, if you think about government purchases, if... If government purchases increase, it's going to actually cause 
aggregate demand to shift right. A few more things we're going to kind of get into is the idea of expectations once more. So with um, household and firm expectations, so we're thinking about individual consumers as well as producer expectations, more optimism leads to increased consumption and investment so aggregate demand shifts right however if we have less optimism consumption and investment will decrease so Aggregate demand shifts left. So if we think about um, with the COVID-19 that's going on specifically right now, um, there is not a lot of consumer confidence or business confidence in, in the economy. And therefore, it's actually causing people to pull back on both of their consumption and investment. Okay, as far as growth rates for domestic GDP relative to foreign GDP growth rates, what we wanna think about is what happens if foreign income rises slower um, than domestic income, so if Foreign income rises slower than domestic. There imports of our goods will decrease. So that reduces overall net exports. So aggregate demand shifts left. Again, let's talk about exchange rates. So if the dollar appreciates in value or increases in value, it makes exports relatively more expensive. So aggregate demand shifts left. Again, exports are more expensive, so overall net exports will fall and aggregate demand will shift left because GDP is decreased. So now that we've talked about aggregate demand, let's talk about aggregate supply. Aggregate supply refers to the quantity of goods and services that firms are willing and able to supply. And so we're going to look at actually two aggregate supply curves. The long run aggregate supply curve, which I'll refer to as LRAS, and the short run aggregate supply curve, which I'll refer to as SRAS. So quickly here, um, I went ahead and just gave you the definition for the SRAS curve. It's a curve that shows the relationship 
in the long run between price level and the quantity of real GDP, in this case, supplied. So remember um, the other one we were looking at, the demand side, now we're looking at the supply side. Um, overall, in the long run, the level of real GDP is determined by the number of workers, the level of technology, and the capital stock. So LRAS does not actually depend on price. So that's really important to remember. It does not depend on the price, and therefore that's why um, LRAS is going to be the long run aggregate supply curve um, is a vertical line. Okay, and it's also um, going to occur at potential or full GDP. Remember, potential and full, potential or full employment GDP. That's where we don't have any cyclical. It's only um, structural and frictional unemployment. So while LRAS is actually going to be vertical, um, straight up and down, since it does not depend on the price, our short run aggregate supply curve, which is a curve, again, that shows the relationship in the short run between um, quantity of real GDP and the price level. price level and quantity of real GDP. So the long run aggregate supply curve was vertical, but the short run aggregate supply curve is actually going to be upward sloping, like what our typical supply curve would look like. So we have price level and we have GDP. Okay, so there's a few reasons why um, the SRAS curve is upward sloping. Um, one being contracts are gonna make wages and prices sticky. Two, firms are often slow to adjust prices and, or adjust wages. And three, menu costs make some prices sticky. So the idea of sticky prices and wages essentially they're not going to respond quickly to changes in demand and supply so some firms and workers are going to fail to predict the price level changes and not build them into these long-run contracts as far as firms being slow to adjust wages um, again salary reviews usually happen annually and um, firms don't like to cut wages it's just um, bad for morale overall Third thing, menu costs. So menu costs, those are the actual costs of changing prices. So think about um, in a restaurant, you're not going to want to keep printing new menus if you have to keep updating your prices every two weeks. So um, it's sometimes not worth the hassle for a firm to adjust for a small change in price. So just like aggregate um, demand, we have to think about um, the shifts of the curve versus movements along the curve. And so when we, again, look at the relationship between the price level and the quantity of real GDP, we're going to hold all other variables constant that are affecting the willingness of firms to supply. And so, again, a change in the price level not caused by factors that would otherwise affect short-run aggregate supply results in a movement along the curve, but there are some factors that cause it to shift, which we'll cover um, really quickly. So the first thing that we want to look at um, as far as a shift of the short-run aggregate supply curve is an increase in the labor force or the capital stock. Um, so when the labor force increases or capital stock increases, remember we talked about that in some past chapters, um, it's going to cause the short-run aggregate supply curve, SRAS, to shift right. And the reason for that is because they're going to be able to produce more output at every price level.
The next thing we want to look at is changes in productivity. So if um, there's an improvement in technology that's enabling this change in productivity or an increase in productivity, what's going to happen is SRAS is going to shift to the right. So again, an increase in productivity shifts the short run aggregate supply curve to the right. And the reason behind that is because the cost to produce is lower. Third thing, the expected future price level. Um, if expected future price level is higher, SRAS is gonna shift left. So this makes sense, again, um, if businesses think the price level is going to increase um, in the future, they're not going to want to supply um, right now, so they're going to pull back on their supply right now. And then if workers and firms adjust to previously underestimated price levels, um, that also, it kind of ties in with uh, the expected future price level because what will happen is they will anticipate the future price level to be higher since they underestimated it. So this will cause, again, SRAS to shift left. And we'll see that because essentially in, in both of these cases for number three and four, workers and firms are going to increase their wages and their prices. The last one, um, an expected price of an important natural resource. So if, um, if expected price increases then the cost of producing increases which causes a left shift which will cause a left shift of that's right and then finally, the last thing that we are going to talk about is a, before we move on to the next section, is the supply shock. What a supply shock is, is an unexpected event that causes the short run aggregate supply curve to shift. So we'll get a little bit more into graphing out a supply shock um, in the next section. So now that we've talked about both aggregate demand, long run aggregate supply, and short run aggregate supply, let's kind of put it together in this last section when we're talking about macroeconomic equilibrium in the long run and the short run. So long run macroeconomic equilibrium occurs when the aggregate demand and short run aggregate supply curves intersect at the long run aggregate supply level, i.e. when the economy is in short run equilibrium and GDP is at its full employment level. We're assuming no inflation and no growth. And so what that looks like is, I'm just going to draw this over here, price level, GDP, and then we have our SRAS curve, 
our aggregate demand curve, and then we have our long run aggregate supply curve. So we have an equilibrium when they're all intersecting. So what actually we briefly touched on um, that very last chapter that we talked about was the idea that long run economic equilibrium is also we can relate it back to the production possibilities frontier curve. So remember with the PPF curve, we talked about, we had our initial PPF curve, and then we had one that was slightly inside, which was referred to as the um, institutional PPF curve. So remember, we can't operate beyond the PPF curve itself, but we can operate anywhere inside it. So remember, the PPF curve shows the maximum uh, attainable combinations of goods the economy can produce. So long-run equilibrium is actually on the institutional PPF curve. So now let's look at what happens if we see a decrease in aggregate demand and an increase in aggregate demand. What happens to uh, long run macroeconomic equilibrium? So we're just going to show here we have price level and we have GDP. So when we have, I'm going to use some different colors just to kind of show what it looks like. We're going to have aggregate demand. And then we can have, we're going to make this a different color. We'll have aggregate supply in orange, short run aggregate supply. And then we'll have our long run in blue. Long run aggregate supply. And then we have our equilibrium point in red. So suppose interest rates go up. So interest rates, remember, um, have to do with investment. So when interest rates go up, um, what happens is it now costs firms more um, to borrow money. Therefore, investment goes down and aggregate demand shifts left. So we're going to see a new aggregate demand curve that shifts to the left. So this is your aggregate 82, this is 81. So we had a left shift of aggregate demand, which now causes our equilibrium to move from A to B. So what happens is workers now are going to lose their jobs because firms are not able to um, fulfill their planned investments. So this causes a recession. So what this, this is called here is a recessionary gap. So what happens eventually is workers will accept lower wages, firms are going to expect lower prices, which is going to actually cause the short run aggregate supply curve to um, go ahead and shift right, um, which restores long run macroeconomic equilibrium, but the price level overall is going to be lower. So we're actually going to see a right shift of the short run aggregate supply curve and then we have a restored macroeconomic equilibrium at a lower price level so price level has fallen so now let's look at the flip side what an increase in aggregate demand would do 
So remember we talked about interest rates falling, so we say interest rates decreased. So for an increase in aggregate demand, let's suppose that firms are going to become more optimistic about the future. So essentially if, um, let, let's talk about if researchers develop a vaccine for the coronavirus, what will happen is I'm going to go ahead and put in the aggregate demand curve. And then we had our short run aggregate supply. And then we had our long run aggregate supply. And then we had our equilibrium. So if it comes out that researchers have developed a vaccine for coronavirus, what will happen is firms will become more optimistic, then they will actually increase their investment, which is going to cause aggregate demand to shift to the right. So now our equilibrium has moved to the right, and what this is called is an expansionary gap. So um, we're seeing more investment, aggregate demand shifting to the right, unemployment is going to fall below its natural rate, which increases wages, and the demand for goods and services, which also raises prices. However, with the expectations of increases in price levels, um, the short run aggregate supply curve is going to then react. And so it will shift to the left. Which restores long run equilibrium at um, LRAS, but price level has increased. So now we've looked at both aggregate demand shifting um, left and right. Let's suppose that supply suddenly shifted. Suppose the aggregate supply curve is now the one that's moving. So that what that's called is a supply shock. And so if there'd be a sudden increase, I don't have as much room down here. If there'd be a sudden increase, in like the price of oil, what would happen is we have aggregate demand. We have our long run. What would happen is short run aggregate supply would end up shifting left. So a supply shock, if the, um, let me see, um, where do I want to put this? If oil prices increased, this is actually the first supply curve. SRAS one, SRAS two, Let's look at equilibrium. Initially it was here. Now equilibrium is over here. And so it's going to cause a recessionary gap um, and stagflation. So it's gonna increase prices all of a sudden um, and also going to um, cause a recession. So what happens when you have um, a sudden increase in prices is that output is also going to um, decrease and people are going to become unemployed. And so over time, workers accept a lower wage, firms decrease the prices um, in order to clean out the inventories and um, 
expectations of prices will fall. So this will cause the short run aggregate supply curve to eventually, so first it moves this way, but eventually it's going to end up shifting back over time which will again will end up restoring long run equilibrium. So in this case someone may wonder, you know, how long does it take to restore to come back to long run equilibrium? And honestly, it just depends. It's a perfect um, economist answer. Um, it depends on the severity of the supply shock, but usually it's likely to take several years. So like the alternative to waiting this long to kind of recover and restore full unemployment or full employment, excuse me, is to um, use fiscal or monetary policy that we discussed about um, government intervention to increase aggregate demand. So this um, may result in permanently higher prices, but it could be worth that that additional cost. So overall, our last section is 13.4, a dynamic aggregate demand and supply model. Um, I just mentioned that it's a little bit complicated. What I want you to focus on really is just specific shifts and decrease in aggregate demand, increase in aggregate demand, and a supply shock, which is a um, either in usually a decrease in aggregate supply and then what um, is happening um, is it a recessionary gap is it an expansionary gap um, etc um, with the dynamic model um, essentially you're going to start incorporating the idea of that um, the long run aggregate supply curve that we kind of talked about up here we're going to talk about how over time time in the dynamic model it's going to shift to the right um, and aggregate demand is also going to be shifting to the right and so um, we're not going to get too much into that um, again just focusing on the specific shifts that we talked about so that about wraps up chapter 13 um, I know it was a lot but um, if you have questions just feel free to email me and let me know